Please be aware that as a movie commentary channel, the Film Optimist is a spoiler-rich environment. Whenever a movie is discussed in a video, the chances for spoilers are high. Enjoy responsibly and in great excess. The cinematic language of nerd is most likely ingrained in your mind no matter when you were born. Coke bottle glasses, clothes that are out of fashion, maybe a bit of a slack-jawed look, pale or sallow skin, messy hair. It's an image that has endured even as, in the past couple of decades, the image of the nerd has shifted toward the cool, with the guy at the desk remaining comic relief, but moving from the butt of the joke to the joke's teller, the image still persists as an I'm-not-that-type-of-nerd archetype. The 80s were arguably the first real push to move the nerd toward coolness. At least some of that can be attributed to the rise of Silicon Valley and the slick, polished, but still rebellious look that was engineered by early tech movers and shakers like Steve Jobs. And part of it can be attributed to the fact that a rise in respectability and success for people with film degrees gave classic nerds an inroad into screenwriting and directing. But while nerds were pushing into the mainstream as heroes rather than pathetic also-rans, there was still something a bit off. For instance, 80s classic Revenge of the Nerds is a great example. See, while the Revenge of the Nerds pushed a narrative of nerds being superior to and victorious over jocks and rich kids, its portrayal of nerds in general is less than flattering. Their nerdiness is always the primary joke. They read science fiction? Isn't that funny nerd behavior? Oh, they went to a Star Trek convention. Of course they did. They're nerds. They obsess over the details of even the most minor genre films as though they were major works of art and literature. Okay, that one's kind of close to home, you guys. It's a model of archetypal nerdiness that has continued pretty much non-stop. Whether it's Screech of Saved by the Bell, Steve Urkel from Family Matters, or Sheldon from The Big Bang Theory, they may be the most popular character, or even the series' lead, but their nerdy interests are always the source of a quick, cheap laugh. But there is another model of the film and television nerd, one that doesn't ask to be made cool, but rather acknowledges that nerds have always been, to some extent, cool, that they can have fun, enjoy life, and find love and friendship not in spite of their nerdiness, but even because of it. It's an approach that is central to 1985's Real Genius, starring Val Kilmer and directed by Martha Coolidge. <music> Born on August 17th of 1946 in New Haven, Connecticut, USA, Martha Coolidge's family tree includes one Calvin Coolidge, the 30th President of the United States of America. Her parents were architects and, for much of her young life, Martha was expected to follow in their footsteps. When she matriculated at the Rhode Island School of Design, she was initially an illustration major. But after hanging around the Dramatic Arts Department and participating in on-campus theatrical productions, she changed her major and became one of RISD's first ever film majors. She continued her studies with an MFA from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, despite one of her interviewers for the program disparaging the very idea of women directors in film. It was an attitude that Coolidge would encounter often. As a film student, she produced a series of biographical short films, often drawing on her own family for material. 1972's David Off and On told the story of her brother, who had spent most of his life struggling with drug addiction. The same year, she produced a profile of her grandmother entitled Old Fashioned Woman, and in 1975, she would produce an autoethnographic short in which she recounted her own experience as the victim of a sexual assault in the film Not a Pretty Picture. 
The American Film Institute awarded her an internship to Zoetrope Studios on the strength of her short films, allowing Coolidge to get her foot in the door of the film industry. Her feature directorial debut is 1983's Valley Girl, starring Nicolas Cage and Deborah Foreman. The raucous indie comedy had a low budget of just $350,000, and, according to Hollywood legend, Coolidge was only able to secure that much to shoot the movie by promising her financiers that she would include naked breasts in at least four scenes. Hello, boys. Have a good night's rest. I missed you. Not only was she relatively unknown in Hollywood at the time, but there was also a major stigma attached to women attempting to direct, especially comedy, with many studio executives insisting that women were incapable of making commercially viable movies. But any doubts were probably answered by Valley Girl's final domestic box office, which totaled over $17 million, more than 48 times the production budget. On top of that, the film was a hit with critics, who praised the comedy's heart and the performances of its leads. The success of Valley Girl led directly to Coolidge being handed $8 million to direct 1985's Real Genius. The screenplay was based on a story by Police Academy and Bachelor Party's Neil Israel and the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour writer Pat Proft, and was written by SCTV alum and WKRP in Cincinnati head writer P.J. Torokve who would also go on to co-write Armed and Dangerous and Caddyshack 2 with Harold Ramis. Star Val Kilmer had only one major film lead under his belt at the time, with his role in Zucker and Abrams' spy spoof, Top Secret. When producer Brian Grazer tells the story of Kilmer's audition, he recalls a friendly, comical event, with the young Juilliard graduate handing out candy bars and performing magic tricks. Kilmer, on the other hand, recalls that he won the role by being purposefully rude to everyone in the room, including telling Grazer, I'm sorry, you look like you're 12 years old. I like to work with men. Chris, this is my assistant, Sherry Nugel. This is me. And this is Mike Dodd. Dr. Dodd. The one who just designed our brand new telecom satellite. It's an honor to meet you, sir. Telecom. <sighs> Isn't that the satellite that's raining debris all over Europe? Why is that toy on your head? Because if I wear it anywhere else, it chafes. The film follows a group of students at Pacific Tech, the movie's stand-in for Caltech, who are working on a government project to build a chemical laser. To prepare for directing the movie, Martha Coolidge spent time at Caltech visiting a lab where they were actually working on laser technology and interviewing dozens of students to get a feel for what it was like to be a young person working in technology in a college lab. The studio promoted the film's release with what it called the world's first computer press conference. Coolidge and the film's producer, Brian Grazer, fielded reporters' questions while seated at computer terminals, with the questions coming in from all over the world thanks to the technological marvel known as CompuServe. I do not have time in this video to explain what CompuServe was, but trust me, it was a very big deal at the time. The resulting film was a success, grossing close to $13 million domestically, but not a box office smash. Critical response was mixed with the film's detractors calling the script dumb. But the film's defenders, including Roger Ebert, who awarded it three and a half stars out of four, praised it for depicting its main characters as truly human and relatable. What you doing? Self-realization. I was thinking of the immortal words of Socrates, who said... I drank what? From her work on Real Genius, Coolidge would move into directing for television, with cult favorite and young film optimist's second favorite sitcom of all time, Sledge Hammer, and has since had a career that moved between the small and large screens, as she went on to direct Rambling Rose, Lost in Yonkers, Introducing Dorothy Dandridge, 
segments for If These Walls Could Talk too, and episodes of Sex and the City, among her many credits. She served as the first woman president of the Directors Guild of America in 2002, an early victim herself of the entertainment industry's prejudice against women and minorities in leadership roles, during her time in office, she struggled to create greater opportunity in the industry for women and POC directors. As she noted in a statement at the end of her term, the DGA and its African American, Asian, Latino, and women's committees have held countless meetings with producers, networks, and studio representatives, conducted nine networking mixers in 2002 to introduce women and minority directors to key showrunners in order to develop new relationships, and have created extensive women and minority director contact lists to counter the argument that quality women and minority directors are difficult to find. With few exceptions, these efforts have not translated into action by the producers and the networks. I never sleep. I don't know why. I had a roommate and I drove her nuts. I mean, really nuts. They had to take her away in an ambulance and everything. But she's okay now, but she had to transfer to an easier school. But I don't know if that had anything to do with being my fault. But listen, if you ever need to talk or you need help studying, just let me know because I'm just a couple doors down from you guys and I never sleep, okay? Coolidge's flair for comedies with heart and her research into her subject pay off in Real Genius by giving us a story about nerds that doesn't try to make nerds cool. Instead, it realizes that nerds are already cool. Who else can organize an ice rink on the floor of a dormitory that will turn straight to a harmless gas when it melts, meaning nobody has to clean up afterward? Who else can rig up the laser lights to turn a standard college party into a rave for the ages? Who can fill a jerkweed professor's house with popcorn and pop it from afar using the heat of an experimental laser? If you want to do that, my friend, then you're going to need nerds. This is not a movie about the pocket protector and horn-rimmed glasses set being unsuspected and unsung sex gods who party like every day is Animal House. Rather, the movie reflects a secret known to many who have set foot on a college campus that the nerds walk among you. They dress like you, they look like you, they listen to music like you, and, given the chance, they'll throw a party you will be telling your friends about for years afterward. Nobody has to take off their glasses or put on a leather jacket. Nobody needs a makeover to be cool, rebellious, and sexy because those things are not exclusive to one group or another. You can be a nerd and be the coolest guy anybody on campus will ever know. It's just that simple. Real Genius's model of film and television nerd is sadly less common than its Revenge of the Nerds counterpart. But it is out there and it can be found. Perhaps one of the more prominent examples to be found in media is in Season 2, Episode 14 of Community, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. 30 minutes of television that explores the community building and therapeutic power of tabletop role-playing games by approaching the subject with the simple guiding principle that an episode about characters playing Dungeons and Dragons is no more unusual than an episode about characters playing poker. There is humor to be found within the game, aside from just poking fun at its players for enjoying the game. Something strange happened to me this morning. Was it a dream where you see yourself standing in sort of sun god robes on a pyramid with a thousand naked women screaming and throwing little pickles at you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why am I the only person that has that dream? Oh. What is wrong with my tongue today? In what can be seen as a testament to the nerd love that Real Genius has built in its after box office cult years, Mythbusters tested the film's climax in 2009 by asking, is it possible to use a laser to fill a house with popcorn just like they did in the movie? The Mythbusters team proved that while it is possible to use the heat from a laser, even a commercially available one, to pop popcorn, a single laser cannot cause popcorn to expand enough to break windows or push a front door off of its hinges. So the climax was only 
partly scientifically accurate. As for the solid chemical laser at the heart of the film's plot, it remains purely fictional to this day, although the film's scientific consultant Martin A. Gunderson is, in fact, cited as a source on the theory of solid chemical lasers in Mario E. Fajardo's and V. A. Abkarian's simulated radiative dissociation and gain measurements of XE2CL in solid xenon, published in 1987 in Chemical Physics Letters, a publication of the University of California, Irvine. Meanwhile, in 2020, Valley Girl was remade as a jukebox movie musical by director Rachel Lee Goldenberg, with Jessica Roth and Josh Whitehouse starring. The film was originally planned for release in 2018, but was delayed due to controversy surrounding co-star Logan Paul. And a wide theatrical release planned for 2020 after its debut in select drive-in theaters was canceled due to the COVID outbreak. Thanks for checking out the video. If there's a movie that shaped young Glenn's vision of what college could be, Real Genius is probably it. Although I wound up studying theater arts and English, not chemical physics. But whatever the subject, it turns out that it is true, in my experience, that nerds throw the best parties. How about you? What movies or media shaped your ideas about college or early adult life? Drop into the comments below and let me know, and as always, relevant links are in the video description. Until next time, watch like it means something.